All righty, let's start off with a question. Would you like to be 40% more productive? Yes. 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 I'm pretty sure that's a trick question. It's not a trick question. So studies from MIT, McKinsey, and lots of other studies have shown that when AI is used within its boundaries, a software engineer's productivity can improve all the way up to 40 to 50%. It's, it's pretty nice, right? So today we're going to talk about how this applies to your developer workflow. Now, there are two key loops in the developer workflow that are worth talking about. There's the fast inner loop, and that's what we spend most of our time. We're usually iterating on code, we're manually debugging, we're authoring our components. And then we've got the broader outer loop, which is where code gets released to the rest of the world. Now, in that inner loop, you often spend a lot of time in IDEs and build tools and places like dev tools. And the outer loop is where you're spending time kind of doing testing, deploying to all kinds of environments, maybe monitoring your code. Now, the traditional version of this workflow is kind of systematic, and it encompasses a number of those phases we were just showing you. So things like planning, designing, coding, testing, releasing, and monitoring. Now, while we spend a lot of our time here, there's a lot of manual steps that, that we end up encountering. There's like manually having to write a lot of boilerplate code, manually having to debug and test and so on. So while we've got really good tools today for lowering the friction of development, we still think that there are a few opportunities to be able to fine tune this a little bit more. And um, I'm personally excited about the productivity wins. So I'm, I'm personally not a procrastinator. I very much am. D David is. Um, I'm very productive at unimportant things. But it's good because we, we, we're at Google I.O. and AI is going to fix everything for us. Exactly. Exactly. All right. So this is where AI comes in um, to enhance developer productivity and enable us to focus on solving high level problems. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, David. Um, think of this as the AI age of developer experience. Now, we should really introduce ourselves. So um, hey, folks. Uh, my name is Addy. I'm an engineering lead working on the Chrome browser. And I'm David East. I am the uh, lead DevRel for Project IDX. And, awesome. uh, and uh, I, don't, I don't really know if I need to be up here right now, because I'm just I mean, doing could, the you demo. You could sit down if you want. I'm just, just going to live tweet. You're going to live tweet? So I'm going to okay. say I'm going to live tweet. All if, right. OK, we're good? Teamwork makes the dream okay. work something. OK, okay. All right. bye, David. All righty. So 44% of developers say that they're already using AI tools as a part of their workflow according to a Stack Overflow um, study from last year. Now, that's huge. And this number just continues to grow and grow. We want to help you get as many of the productivity wins as possible. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of Google's offerings here, but I also want to talk about some things that just generally apply regardless of what you're using. Now, Google's got a deep history of innovation where generative AI uh, is concerned, um, including Gemini. So Gemini, you've probably heard a lot about it, but it's our most capable model built from the ground up to be multimodal, works well with text, with code, with images, and with video. Now, as I mentioned, we're going to talk about the developer workflow today in a way that applies regardless of what tools or models that you might be using. We're also going to cover some of Google's tools, but things like um, Gemini Advanced for chat, uh, Gemini API for building on uh, IDX or Gemini Code Assist, all of these things are great um, as well and are, are worth checking out. Now, AI can help us across the entire developer workflow, starting off with augmentation and moving all the way through to automation. Augment with AI to get started, and then automate to get really, really effective. So there's a really big spectrum of opportunities here. But you don't have to try it all you know, out at once. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go stage by stage through the software engineering lifecycle and talk a little bit about the opportunities some more. So you can dip your toe in the water with AI with just a, small, a few small parts of your workflow. To augment, you could do things like get instant code answers that provide explanations and examples. You could receive guided code migrations to help you keep your code um, on bleeding edge versions of frameworks. You could detect bugs and potential issues early on in the development process. Let's go through some of these in a little bit more detail. So we're going to start off with code answers. Now, we often need quick answers to coding questions while we're working, because we don't want to, uh, to sort of break our flow state. Now, AI-powered code answer tools allow us to ask questions in natural language. And like I'm doing with this JavaScript snippet that has a bug, 
it can give me sort of feedback in terms of what the bugs are. It can explain complex topics. It can suggest potential fixes. And it saves me time having to search through you know, detailed documentation or online forums. Now, this is great because it helps me get unstuck a little bit faster without having to learn too many new concepts breaking my, my flow state. We can also talk about autocomplete. Now, code autocompletion is one of the most useful AI power tools for developers. As you type, the AI suggests the next likely tokens based on your project's context and the common patterns that you might be working with. This can save time by reducing typos and minimizing the need to refer to docs. Even advanced autocompletion tools can do things like understand what frameworks, what tech stacks you're using, and potentially continue using those as a part of the responses that it's generating. There's also guided migrations. You can modernize legacy code bases with less effort using AI-guided migrations, such as with AI Studio, as I'm showing you here. So here, I'm migrating a vanilla JavaScript app to React. I could be do migrating to any sort of modern framework. Now, tools like Google AI Studio give you a pretty actionable list of what to do, as well as personalized examples that can help you streamline the process of refactoring and updating your code, your components, your tests. They can analyze code structures. You can get really, um, really uh, actionable lists of what to do next and can save yourself some time. Now, another cool use case for AI code migrations is getting old code to build at all. We've all got projects, right, that are years and years old, and we, we just feel bad about them. We don't want to touch them, but we'd love them to be working again. Um, and I had a five-year-old app that was built using a framework. I couldn't get it to build. I tried using NPM audit. I tried you know, reading through docs. I was, I was really struggling with this. But I threw it into AI Studio, and in just a few minutes, it identified a few issues in my package.json file. I was able to get it fixed and running uh, once again without too much of a headache. So really helpful stuff. There's also code chat. Now, Gemini, ChatGPT, Claude, and many other options offer you code answering capabilities. But what about something that's more integrated inside your IDE? Now, with the full context of the code that you're working on, it could potentially offer you um, a lot more value. So imagine having sort of a coding expert right at your fingertips. With something like Code, a, uh, code Chat, that, that's effectively what you've got. You can understand complex code blocks. It can generate new code that follows your project's best practices. And it can solve problems across components and across the boundaries. Really powerful stuff. So we've looked at a few ideas around augmenting your workflow. But what about doing even more to automate it? Now, as you move further along the spectrum of AI assistance possibilities, you can do things like um, full automated code generation and refactoring, or get pretty close to it. You can automate writing tests. You can identify and fix relatively complex bugs. And there's some really big productivity wins to be had if we can get this right. Worst case, never spend five minutes doing something by hand when you can spend five hours failing to automate it, is, is how I think about this. So automated code generation. Um, it can take AI assistance to the next level by automatically writing code based on your intent. So here, I'm describing what I want to do in natural language. And it can generate me working code. It can generate comments. It can address logic bugs that I want it to go and, and, and address. And this is really helpful for things like boilerplate code, data models, and common algorithmic tasks that you might be dealing with. But by automating a lot of the more mundane parts of development, that frees us up to think about sort of our logic, our features, and the delightfulness aspects of our apps just a little bit more. So here we can see the same idea with Gemini Code Assist. This is in VS Code. You can select a range of code and ask it to help you with a task in line, such as generating you comments. And there, it's, it's working. Boom, it's doing some great stuff. So test generation is also something that I'm interested in. Testing is a huge requirement for ensuring product and code quality. But our testing journeys tend to be complex, and they could cover every aspect of software development, whether it's local, pre-submit, post-submit, or release. Now, there's a lot of opportunities here for AI to be assistive, um, whether it's across velocity, so faster test authoring, quality, so writing better tests, or cost, so like making sure that our tests are less flaky. So I'm back in AI Studio, and it can generate me tests that you know, I might review, refine, and execute. So in this example, Gemini is generating unit tests for a JavaScript app. 
It was able to select a testing library for me, something popular. It was able to suggest tests by units of code and write out those tests as well. AI can also do things like troubleshoot and provide fixes for errors in your tests. It can identify test coverage issues or provide you guidance on how you can just generally improve test quality. Super helpful. Code migrations are something I, I alluded to being um, interesting earlier. But earlier, we were looking at a guided migration. But it can also help with automating full source migrations, too. So here, we're fully migrating an app from modern vanilla JavaScript to TypeScript using AI Studio. We're handling syntax and interface updates, especially where there are established best practices that happen to be in, in many models training data sets. AI is pretty good at helping us out with these kinds of problems. Now, more complete versions of this idea could do things like you know, run your tests against them to make sure that they're actually correct. And in, you know, once you've got correctness in place, your ability to trust the output is in a, is a decent place as well. So there's a lot of potential here, too. I also want to talk to you about code agents. Now, AI code agents, or SWE agents, as you may have heard them refer to, can execute and plan tasks based on your goals. Um, they ideally understand and complete really complex programming tasks with very little human input. And the idea is that you can kind of have it read instructions, break them down into simpler steps, and then go and execute on them, whether it's figuring out the right you know, commands to run, whether it's searching the web, whatever it happens to be that helps you accomplish your goal. I think that AI agents have a lot of potential to help us um, in our developer workflow. Uh, so here we're seeing this idea with Project IDX, which David is going to talk a little bit more about later. So there's a lot here also happening in the third-party tooling space beyond just code. Uh, here's one example that was shared by Paige Bailey recently using Zapier for workflow automation. So for each new email that you receive, you could use something like Google AI Studio to check if that email has constructive feedback about your open source project. If it does, you can automatically have it file an issue on your repo and tag it as a bug. That's something that's time saving and I think is a good value add. If you're thinking, wow, that is a lot of AI, we've achieved our goal for Google I.O. Now, AI is being integrated across the development lifecycle to automate repetitive tasks and really provide intelligent assistance. The goal is to have AI seamlessly assist you at each step so you iterate quickly while ensuring quality. So I'm excited to show you how we're integrating many of these ideas into a more seamless experience. And to show you this live, I'd like to welcome back to the stage David East. Yeah! Thank you. Woo! Oh. So this right here is Project IDX. And as it's loading, what it's going to do is it's going to load up all these files, which is a uh, Vt and React app. And this is something that you just get if you're creating like a Create Vt app uh, out of the box. And what we're doing is it's all running in the cloud. It, uh, you have access to a full uh, VM underneath with, with the terminal. And there is a lot of AI assistance. And what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to show you a lot of things that Addy just covered all of the tics, uh, tri tips and techniques Addy showed you, all the things that look very awesome in practice. We're going to do a few of them up here. So this is just a count app. And if I click, it counts up. Now, for AI code completion, one of the ways, uh, or for code generation, one of the things Addy showed you was AI code completion. And so I have this count app here. Well, I'd like to be able to reset. And if you look down there at the bottom, as I type in a button, it kind of already assumes, hey, this is a count app. Let's do a reset. So if I hit tab at the appropriate time, I get a reset button. And so that works. But now if I go and try to add another button, it says, hey, I see you've added. You want to reset. Maybe we also want to subtract. And one of the most important concepts when you're doing any type of uh, AI workflow is you want to be able to provide as much context. And you would be surprised to how much little context goes such a long way. So in this case, I have these buttons where it just says count is count. Well, what if I say, hey, add and subtract? And then now when I go to create a button, it says, oh, OK, well, now it's multiply by 2. And uh, oh, and maybe let's divide by two. And then as I create buttons, 
it says, you know what? Let's add 10. And all right, how about let's subtract 10? And I'm not kidding you. I've done this all day. And it just keeps going and going. Multiply by 10. What do you, what do you all think the next one's going to be? Divide by 10. What, any takers? What's the next one? Power by 10. Power by 10. Add 100. Eh, sorry. So now as I save, I have this whole thing. I can add, I can subtract, I can multiply, I can subtract 10, and I can divide. I can do, oh, okay, well, I don't even know what's happening. Reset. But I basically just went and created a calculator. And all I did was hit the tab button. So this is code completion. But I would really like to show you some other things as in uh, code agents. So if I open up Gemini. Right in here, I can have code chat. And this is where I can have conversations. It's aware of the content of my code base, so it can give me a lot of intelligent responses. But one of the things that we've launched uh, on an experimental basis within Project IDX is our interactive chat. And this is very similar to what Addy is talking about with code agents. And so not only can I chat with my code base, but I can actually get it to take action upon it. So we see these examples here. Well, I can say right down here, it asks, what process is running on port 8080? Well, what process is running on port 8080? Let's find out. Well, before it goes and tells me, that's going to require a command. And it always puts you in control. So you can say, run the terminal command, or maybe I don't want to run that command. So before it just goes and runs something on there, you always have the permission to say what does and does not happen. So in this case, I know this command. This is basically how it's going to figure out. So I run it. It pops up the terminal, showing me the output of what it does. And I can see down here it's node. But if, even if I didn't know what this meant, I can look over here. And it says the process running on 8080 is node. So it gives it back to me in you know, actual English. So now I have this count app. But when we're learning how to program, we kind of learn in these different app you know, tiers. The first tier is hello world. And then the second tier, yeah, the count app fits it. Then the third tier is a to-do app. So let's just move this app up to a to-do app state. So I'm going to copy and paste this prompt into here. And we'll read through it so there's no surprises. And it's kind of small down there, but it says, create a file named app.jsx that creates a redu redux reducer function that uses React's use reducer hook that can add and delete items in a UI and take input from the user for new items. So a really fancy way of saying I want it to do app. So now when I hit Enter, it's going to start thinking about the prompt. It's going to be taking a look at the code base, reaching out to Gemini, and it gives me this prompt where it says, hey, Gemini wants to update this file, which is this one right here, app.jsx. Now, just like before, I am still in control. So I can say either update the file, but I probably want to review the changes. So as I click here, I get a diff in line of what it wanted me to do. And I can see it's uh, removing a whole lot of the imports that I was using before. It's setting initial state for me. It's created that reducer function I've asked for. I can see these dispatch items. And it's even trying to go and create some new UI. And inside the UI, I can see it's trying to set the items and everything. And you know what? This looks good. Let's, let's see if it, if it works. So I'm going to update the file. And then now over here in the web panel, and if I refresh, it's not working, because that is always how stuff goes. So I am going to take a look into a new tab to see what's going on. And so use state is not defined. So it missed an import. But if I wasn't being so, sorry, let me go back to full screen. If I wasn't being so lazy, I could actually ask it a question where I could say something. I could go to the code chat and say, I'm, uh, what is missing from my imports? And it's going to go take a look at the context of this open file. And I probably should have stated the other file, but we'll see how it goes. And it's saying, oops, the imports, the use state import is missing from your imports. And I could go and ask it to do it, but this is a small one. So I'll just say use, uh, use state. So now I'll save. And I have this to do app. And because Vite comes with a lot of really cool CSS classes. I'm just going to import that, and it gets it to the center. So Vite's not just good for a web server. It also can help you center your code. So now if I say, will this work? Add item. And again, add item. And if I delete, it deletes. So I have this working to-do app. Woo! It's a to-do app, people. Come on. Um, uh, but 
I can't just send this up to my team. If I sent this up to my team, they would say like, David, this isn't JavaScript. We are a TypeScript shop. And you know what? I don't really know a ton about TypeScript. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to get Gemini to do it for me. So I'm going to write a prompt that says, uh, create a file named app.jsx that uh, converts the contents of app. Oh, sorry, app.tsx that converts the context from app.jsx uh, from JavaScript to TypeScript. And then I'm going to give it a little extra advice. I'm going to say, uh, create any types as needed during the conversion process. So now I'm going to hit Enter. It's going to read the app.jsx file. And it's going to say, hey, I got something for you. So I'll review the changes again. And as I look at it, this looks like the right imports I need. I can see that I have a, it's created the type. It's annotated the types where needed. And it's kept my UI in place. So I'm going to go and create the file. And then now when I save, there is always a little bit of an error. So we can get it to figure it out for us. So it says React refers to UMD Global, but you know, consider it import instead. So I know that it missed the import for React. I could paste that in. I could use uh, a ton of other ones. But in this case, I'll just go and fix it. And now it's going to say, hey, there's an issue with this property. Type name is missing. I can copy this over and say, in app.tsx, I have a TypeScript error. And one of my favorite things about IEXs is that you can actually use a little bit of markdown formatting, and it kind of spruces it up for you. And it's saying, hey, you're not including name. That's what, he, that's what they try to tell you. So what we can do inside of handle add item is something like this. I could ask the agent to do it for me, or I can hover over here, and I can click this insert button, and then that gets uh, went over the wrong one, which is probably why I should ask the agent to do it for me. But I'll hover over here, insert this in, and I want to actually it got the, oh, I see. It's trying to use this one as the example. But in this case, I'll just give it a fake name, save. And then now, uh, uh, everything, well, actually, I didn't render this one as working. But it did this whole conversion for me. And then now I have a TypeScript app. So one last thing I want to show, uh, well, one last debugging thing I want to show is that a lot of times when we're debugging, we have lots of errors thrown. So in this case, I'm going to give it a nice and good error message. And what can happen is, is as I add this error message, I'm going to give it a nice refresh just to make sure HMR isn't messing with me. And I'm going to say, uh, hello, add the item. And then I get this error log to the console. And now, if this was a more sophisticated error, it would be better. But in this case, I can click this new button that we've added to IDX called Debug Error with Gemini. And what it does is it forwards the stack trace of your issue into the Gemini assistance. And then IDX is like, hey, buddy, you, you threw an error called LOL. Maybe to fix this, you don't throw an error of LOL. And so I can take its advice by going and just updating the code. And then now. I have my bug fixed. Yeah. All right. So one of the last things I want to do is I want to show, we've talked a lot about what, uh, what you can do with AI and all these things to build with AI. But I want to show something that's very pragmatic and how we can take different APIs together to build something that's actually very practical and does a lot of really cool things. So this is a trip planning application that's built with Gemini and with the new photorealistic API uh, that was shipped from Google Maps. And the way it works is, is that I have these images. And then from here, I can upload this image to Gemini and then say, where, send it a prompt, where if I scroll down to the code here, this is what's happening here. I say, what is the name of this place and where can I see it? And I attach one of the images that are selected. And then from here, I generate the response. I can stream the response back down here. And then I can geocode the place into the map and then ask it for nearby lodging. So if I click, where can I see this? It generates, generates. And it says, oh, you can find this in Singapore. And it gives me this new photorealistic uh, map that I can click around and see all these different hotels. 
I can zoom out, and I mean, look at this. It's like so snappy, and it's like I'm there. So this is mixing different APIs together in order to get AI output from one and then feed that into uh, a, a, an API that doesn't need AI output into another. And so by processing these, things, these two things together, there's so much that you can achieve just all from the limits of your creativity. So that is my demo section. And Addy's going to come back on. And I showed you a lot of things with debugging, but Addy's actually going to go even further in. So please welcome Addy back on stage. Hi. All righty. So let's talk a little bit about debugging. Now, AI-assisted debugging can really supercharge how we find and fix bugs in our apps. Now, debugging, just as a reminder for everybody, is the process of finding and fixing problems in software so that it functions as intended. And there's a lot of different ways, like time-tested, true ways of accomplishing this. You could talk to a rubber duck. You could go for a walk. I personally love rerunning my code again and again and again and again and hoping for a better outcome. It just never works for me. But what about AI? Should AI belong somewhere over here or over here, just everywhere? Well, who knows? So David and I, as David was mentioning, we have a travel app. We're planning on taking a vacation after I.O., but I don't know how much to trust some of those pretty photos that David was showing us. So I wanted to know what the weather was really like at some of these locations. So I implemented a weather component that I wanted to render above this map. It's just calling a weather API. So we're going to run the app with that component loading. Ah, OK. So it looks like I've got an issue over here in DevTools. Something went wrong. And it looks like we've also got a new little bulb icon here that says, understand this error. Let's go ahead and click on it. Now, rather than having to Google um, for an answer to these issues, it looks like I could more quickly understand the issue with a fix from Gemini. Now, it's generating me some helpful insights here. It's cool. Um, let's look at this just a little bit more slowly. So in this case, Chrome DevTools has used Gemini to generate a personalized explanation of the issue. It's taken into account appropriate context from the console. So it could be doing things like uh, taking context from my stack traces, from my headers, and so on. And it's also offered me a potential solution. So if I wanted, I could also go and do a search. Now, in this case, I made a super rookie mistake I forgot to include a real API key when I was calling the API to get weather responses. So it's effectively told me what I need to go and fix. Um, it's detected that problem. So I'm going to go and fix it and just see what happens. Now, I want to show you that in a second. But this is all powered by Gemini. It's the new Chrome DevTools console insights feature. Using it, you can get personalized contextual insights that help you find and fix issues way, way faster. Um, it's experimental and starting to roll out to select regions now, starting off with the US. We're really, really excited about this, and we hope you're going to try it out. All right. So thank you. So let's try that one more time with this fix applied and see if it works. Maybe. Maybe. All right, there we go. My trust in my good friend David has been restored. Thank you, David. Now, in recent years, the emergence of LLMs um, in AI coding assistance has really opened up a lot of possibilities for us where debugging is concerned. AI can help as a pair programmer. It can help as a pair debugging assistant. Um, and there's a lot of opportunities here. So we wanted to just give you some best practices to follow as you explore some of the features like the new console insights feature. So a few best practices. The first one is include enough context. The more context that you can include, the higher a chance you have of any AI actually being able to give you a good, helpful response. So post in, po uh, make sure to paste in the full error message. If you've got a stack trace, include that. Any you know, code snippets that may be relevant, include those too. We try to do as much of that for you as we can in DevTools. Make sure to evaluate the output manually. Now, Check any suggested fixes that you know, LLMs are generating for you. And make sure you're not blindly accepting um, solutions. Check their correctness. 
And also make sure to consider AI as an augmentation of your debugging skills, but not as a replacement. The idea here is really to help leverage it for quick answers and to make you more productive, but to not completely blindly defer to it. So those are three helpful tips for debugging uh, using AI. We hope that you find them helpful. Now, um, we're going to be wrapping up soon, but uh, I wanted to show you one more thing that we're really excited about. Now, traditionally, AI models only ran on powerful servers on cloud infrastructure. But you can also run much smaller models um, for simpler use cases on your own devices, too. Many people here, like you've got a powerful laptop, you've got powerful phones. It's very possible to run on-device models on them. Now, on-device AI can create a relatively fast experience. Results can often appear instantly without you having to wait on a server. There's very little latency in place. It can also put you in control. Um, Data stays on your device, so it's really good for things like privacy. Um, and it also you know, respects your server budget, especially if you're considering hybrid approaches, like using on-device AI and, and you know, still relying on the server. Now, on-device models um, might sound great on paper, but they're not viable if every single site has got to download their own LLM, because those can be pretty large. Um, so what if your browser had a built-in LLM? What if you had APIs to talk to that on-device LLM? Well, sensing that this could unlock a whole range of different opportunities, we recently started working on a proof of concept of this idea um, with Gemini Nano built into Chrome um, with some high-level APIs. And I wanted to show you uh, a version of this experiment in action. So we've completed our trip, and I wanted to write up a review for it. Now, I, I really suck at writing reviews. I tend to make them very, very long. Um, and I wanted to get some help summarizing it. So here, what I really want is some assistance with generating things like a helpful title, maybe making my review a little bit more terse, and also just checking that the tone um, isn't considered harmful. So let's see it in action. First, we've got generate title. So I've got a review I've written, and I hit generate title. Look at how quick that was. There's no very, very little latency. It just worked. I can also do things like summarize the review um, instantly and have that work. I can check on my tone, make sure that it's not you know, considered toxic or bad in any way. And all of this is happening on your device instantly. It's a really incredible opportunity, and we're really excited to, to explore what's possible with this. Now, we, of course, also care about cross-browser support. So remember, the API in the last demo was experimental and Chrome-specific. But we can fall back to the Gemini API in other browsers and still offer you an experience where we can generate the title, where we can still offer up a summary, where we can still check on tone and things like that. So if these ideas seem interesting, please do engage with the team on them. We are allowing people to sign up for a very early preview program where you'll get a chance to try out some of these ideas and give us some feedback. We're really excited to hear what you think. And there's a great article you can check out about this topic. OK, so today we've seen how AI is transforming the developer experience at every stage of the workflow. With AI-powered IDEs, such as IDX that David was showing earlier, you've got an intelligent coding companion that can really help you write code and fix problems much, much faster. Debugging becomes much more efficient with things like IDX's built-in support for Gemini, as well as the Chrome DevTools support for Gemini that we just announced. And tools like Gemini Advanced, Code Assist, and many others can make a really big difference to your productivity. So one more thing I wanted to talk about real quick is trust, where AI is concerned. Now, um, the reason I wanted to show you some cookies on, on up here is that raisin cookies that look like chocolate chip cookies are the main reason I personally have trust issues. I don't know about other people. This is the bane of my existence. Um, trust is also pretty applicable to AI. So what influences how we think about AI in our workflow? And it's really three things. It's familiarity, trust, and control. And so we wanted to leave you with a framework to keep in mind for the future. So as familiarity increases through continued interaction with AI, you start to tune your expectations. You begin to shape your mental model, and you begin to understand how your actions shape it. So familiarity is really important. Trust is something that's earned over time. And it can be understood in terms of the ability of an action to be reliable. And we expect you know, things like high quality suggestions to be reliable and to be consistent. But that trust can fluctuate over time. 
Like if you're running, uh, if you're using AI in one project and the responses are very high quality and you go to another and then they're not, that's going to impact how you think about things like trust. So trust has to be there. And finally, control is key. The desired level of control that you might have could be impacted by things like trust, by tax complexity as well. We want flexibility and control, so you still being in the driver's seat as much as possible where a lot of these tools are concerned. So AI tools factoring in your feedback and your preferences is something that we're keeping in mind and are thinking about as we continue to evolve these tools. So thank you for choosing this session or watching it whatever year it is on YouTube. I hope that it was useful. Now, the AI-assisted workflow isn't just about building apps faster. Um, it's really about leveraging AI to build the next generation of intelligent, user-centric experiences. And by adopting workflows like this, you're not just a user of these tools, but you're an active participant in shaping their future. So we hope that you're going to try out things like IDX, Chrome DevTools, and many of the other tools that we showed you today. I hope that you got some value out of this talk from David and I. Thank you so much.